Good afternoon. Welcome to the New America Foundation. My name is Peter Bergen. I run the International Security Program here. So with a lot of pleasure, I get to introduce uh, Hannah Armstrong, who's uh, a research fellow at New America um, and is writing based in Algiers and writes uh, about uh, North African Sahelian politics. Uh, she's in the middle of writing a book. Who's it for? Hearst. Hearst, uh, which is looking at the question of rebellion uh, in, the, in that region and, and uh, its kind of conflation with terrorism and counterterrorism issues. She previously served as a Fulbright Fellow in Morocco. She's written for the New York Times, the New Republic, the Financial Times, and she holds an MA in International Studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies, which uh, in many ways is the best school for that subject in the world, I think. Maybe Sorbonne would be a competitor. So Hannah is going to kind of give us a 20 minute or so um, kind of setup, and then we'll engage her in Q&A. So thank you for Hannah. Thanks very much. <coughs> Do I need to talk into this, or is no, that it from should, a come on. OK. Thanks very much for coming. Uh, I was speaking with an Algerian friend about a group of luxurious villas in central Algiers, and he described one as being so big you cannot see it. It struck me that this was a very apt description for the Algerian pouvoir, or power, which consists of the executive branch, the intelligence services, and the army. The head of the intelligence services is sometimes known as the god of Algeria. This means, in some ways, that the power is everywhere and nowhere all at once, making it notoriously hard to pin down the inner workings of the Algerian system. Having said that, I'm going to try to speak today about how Algeria has coped with the tumultuous past few years, which have seen governments in Tunisia, Libya, and Mali overthrown, and which have spilled cross-border instability and terrorism throughout the Sahel. In the end, the instability on Algeria's borders has actually helped the Bouteflika regime to stay in power and to convince a population still traumatized by the civil war in the 1990s that stability equals continuity. But while external threats are helping to promote internal cohesiveness, Algeria is very aware, perhaps more so than Western countries, which have a bit more physical distance to cushion the blow, of the risks that these new threats pose to Algeria and to its neighbors and is therefore working to resolve conflicts in Libya and Mali through peaceful dialogue and negotiations. Nevertheless, peace remains a distant prospect for both of these Saharan countries, and the entire region has been made extremely vulnerable by the deteriorating security climate in the Sahel that has accompanied the so-called Arab Spring. I'd like to start by looking at how threat perception has changed in Algeria since the 1990s. So during the civil war of the 1990s, the threat to the state was internal and overwhelmingly concentrated in the north of the country, where 90% of the population resides. You'll recall that following an economic crisis, protests in Algeria were violently suppressed, leading to an overhaul of the single party system and a sudden political and economic liberalization. The Islamist Feast Party had sweeping victories until the military canceled the 1991 parliamentary elections and banned the party, which was driven underground and waged a bloody insurgency against the state. Algeria today views itself as post-Arab Spring and is watching uncomfortably as very similar stories unfold in Egypt, Libya, and Tunisia. The threat to Algeria today is judged to be at its uncontrollable Saharan borders. It sees itself as being beset on all sides with risk. Algeria borders seven Saharan states, as you can see here, counting the Western Sahara. Uh, Morocco, Mauritania, Mali, Niger, Libya, and Tunisia. That means it has nearly 4,000 miles of borders with these countries in desert. That's about twice as long as the US border with Mexico. And we all know that that can be pretty porous. Most of these borders have been closed, and the border crossings have been placed under military control. Even Morocco, a stable, tourist-friendly kingdom, is ranked as high risk by foreign ministry officials, 
on account of the cannabis trafficking, but also mainly as a result of the long-running spat between the two countries. That's primarily about the Western Sahara. So since the Arab Spring, it's the southern Saharan part of Algeria, which makes up 90% of the whole territory, but holds only 10% of its population that has become the key to protecting the country from the threats which are now judged as being external and hailing particularly from the conflicts in Mali and Libya. So to sum up, the national security disposition has had to reorient itself from focusing on internal northern threats to looking at external southern threats, which has entailed a militarization of Saharan borders, as well as enormous investments in deploying auxiliary land and air forces to patrol the desert. Let's look now at Algeria's principled stance against intervention and its warnings and attempts to prevent interventions in both Mali and Libya. I think this is particularly relevant now as France is pushing for yet another intervention in Libya, which is backed by some West African countries who feel that the chaos that the first intervention resulted in will best be cleaned up with a second intervention. Algeria has a constitutional stance against foreign interventions, which it considers an attack on national sovereignty and a neo-colonial tactic of interference. As one high-ranking Algerian diplomat told me, it's something that is part of our deeper convictions that shape our foreign policy. Good neighbor policy, peaceful settlement of conflict, and the strict observance of non-intervention and non-military action of our army outside of our borders. In 2011, before NATO began supporting Libyan rebels trying to overthrow the Qaddafi regime, Algeria, no great friend of the Qaddafis, was warning that any intervention would have dramatic consequences for the region and would inexorably result in the rise of tribalist militias and cross-border terrorism, which is, of course, exactly what has happened. With Mali, Algeria was already involved in a negotiation process prior to the French intervention there in January 2013. Algeria was working to bring radical Islamist and secular Tuareg rebels to the table to agree upon one set of demands to negotiate with the Malian government. When the Islamist Ansar Din group suddenly withdrew from those talks and mysteriously began a new offensive on southern Mali which was what prompted the then president, Diancuno Traoré, to ask France to help, them to help stop the militants before they would reach Bamako. Algeria is sometimes said to have cooperated with the French intervention by opening its airspace to French warplanes, but this has not been confirmed. At any rate, Algeria stepped in in the months after the intervention to launch a comprehensive dialogue for peace inviting all of the actors, including civil society, tribal elders, drug traffickers, and former Islamist rebels, to Algiers for talks. There is a strong awareness in Algeria that as long as the political status of northern Mali remains disputed, the security situation cannot be improved, as the UN peacekeeping force deployed there in MINUSMA is quickly finding out. Attacks have been quickening their pace, and even elected officials are now being targeted. The Western counterterrorism strategy in the Sahel has been memorably, memorably described as whack-a-mole. You beat them in one place and they pop up in another. Algeria's position, partly out of principle and partly as a concerned neighbor under threat, is that it is more important to do the complex legwork to find political solutions. For Algeria, the problem in Libya is that the NATO intervention broke the state's monopoly on violence and handed it to militias to fight over. Meanwhile, other countries, including Qatar, Turkey, the UAE, and Egypt, are arming and funding or otherwise supporting militias in Libya. Algeria, on the contrary, is pushing for DDR and working overtime to promote dialogue between parties of conflict in Libya and in Mali that will resolve the political issues at the heart of these security crises. This is proving so far in the short term much easier to do for Mali than for Libya. Um, and I've been around for 
a few phases of the Mali negotiations in Algiers. If people want to ask questions about that in the q and I'm happy to talk about that. Um, let's look now at some of the spillover that Algeria has experienced due to the conflicts, especially in Mali and in Libya. So Algeria's stance on intervention in its neighborhood or its backyard is not just principled, it's also based on an accurate assessment of how it stands to be affected by foreign military interventions or crises. There are two striking examples of how the threat of spillover has in fact been borne out. The first is well known and is the attack on the Tigantarin natural gas plant at Enaminas, which is just next to the, the Libyan border, as you can see over there. Um, when you had a few dozen terrorists who took hundreds of people hostage on one of Algeria's most significant extractive industry installations. Uh, these militants, who belong to Mokhtar Bel Mokhtar's Al Murabitun Brigade, crossed over from the Libyan border to wage their attack. Securing the Libya Algeria border was once the task of the Algerian and the Libyan forces. Now that the Libyan forces are no longer there or able to protect the Libyan side of the border, the Algerians can only do their best to control what happens while you have militias and terrorist groups on the other side. Areas now such as southern Libya and Derna on the coast are viewed as Africa's newest and most dangerous terrorist training camps with links to the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria and even to Boko Haram in Nigeria beginning to crystallize. The second case of spillover is one that has received much less attention that I want to look at. And it's also one that's more directly linked to the French intervention in northern Mali. It took place at a little border town called Borj Baji Mokhtar, which you can see just north of the Malian border, and that's marked on the map here. Um, the French, uh, during the intervention, had allied with Tuareg rebels in the north and were relying on them to call in airstrikes against terrorist militants. Uh, and at one point, the Idnan Tuareg groups called in French airstrikes against the Barabish Arab group, um, which was another rebel group that was also engaged in trafficking. And so the Tuaregs basically used the French to wipe out their rival traffickers, who, according to them, had no connections to the terrorist Muja group whatsoever. So this inflamed tensions between the Idnan Tuaregs and the Barabish Arabs throughout the region, which spread from the town of In Khalil, which is just on the Malian side of that border, into Borj Baji Mokhtar, on the Algerian side of that border. Um, it led to the killing of 20 people in this small town, and the Algerian had to, the military had to be deployed. One final risk to Algeria um, that goes along with this change in the national security disposition relative to new external threats is the risk of a war of attrition. The costly deployment of resources to police these borders against an invisible enemy is a drain on public finance, risks lasting many years, and takes money away from more important investments in infrastructure, health, and education. Now this may all sound very grave indeed, but let's turn to how the crises on the borders may actually be helping Algeria by promoting internal stability. The domestic situation for Algeria looking forward might surprise you. The political and security situation is much more stable than one would expect, I would say, uh, in light of the president's age and infirmity and the crises deepening on the borders. Political instability in Tunisia and civil war in Libya may represent a challenge for national se security, but they have worked as a political opportunity, and the Algerian regime has used these to its own political advantage. There's some precedent for this. The proliferation of the threat of terrorism, not only in North Africa in the past few years, but across the West since 2001, has strengthened the legitimacy of the Algerian regime, which was under much greater scrutiny before the attacks on the Twin Towers for its role in the massacres of civilians during the Black Decade. President Abdelaziz Bouteflika came to power in 1999 on a platform of peace and reconciliation, and astutely used the attacks of September 11th to rehabilitate Algeria's image within the international community by stating repeatedly that Algeria had been on the front lines of what George W. Bush had just started calling the war on terror 
for already at least a decade. More recently, Bouteflika used the argument that stability equals continuity to convince Algerians to vote him in for a fourth term, despite his obvious infirmity and in defiance of Article 88 of the Constitution, which allows for a suspension of the presidency in the event of a serious and lasting illness that would prevent him from fulfilling his functions. In the lead up to uh, April elections last year, the Algerian papers kept reporting that the president was meeting with the army chief of staff to discuss border security, indicating that the army supported the fourth term of Bouteflika. Algerians had to take the word of the official press agency as Bouteflika was unable to utter one coherent sentence in public. He is 77 and suffered a crippling stroke in April of 2013. One retired Algerian diplomat called this a form of security blackmail, this tactic of convincing Algerians that the stability of the country was contingent upon the continuity of the Bouteflika regime. Um, so I think that the internal situation being relatively stable, excuse me, um, looking forward, you know, there are two things that I think it's important to keep an eye on. Um, the first is protests in the South, and the second is the problem of oil and gas prices plummeting, which is something other countries are experiencing as well. So unlike in urban areas of Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt, protests in Algiers have occurred on a much smaller scale, at least in the time that I've been in the country. Um, protesting is still illegal in Algeria due to the crackdown on civil liberties that took place in the 1990s. Opposition to Bouteflika taking a fourth term was expressed by the Barakat movement, but failed to draw more than a few dozen people to protest and was easily controlled by police. Some even felt it had been infiltrated by the intelligence services to channel opposition sentiment. But in the South, something interesting is happening. Protests are regularly erupting in the gas and oil rich areas such as Wagla, Lahuat, and Ain Salah, um, and Taman Rasat as well, sometimes in Janet too. So regularly that the Algerian press has begun describing the South as having entered a permanent state of protest. I think the term resource regionalism, which Jeff Porter has used to describe similar trends elsewhere in the Sahel, like in Libya and Mali, gets at the essence of what is happening here. These are southern Saharan populations who feel that the bulk of their country's massive wealth is drawn from their region, while their level of development fails to reflect this. Usually, protesters' specific demands center on state jobs and housing. Now, this is in no way to say that a separatist uprising is in Algeria's near future. And on the contrary, southern populations are both ethnically diverse and committed to Algerian nationality. But it does test the limits of the state's authority to resolve complex internal issues and has added fuel to some politicians' charges that there is a vacant place where the pouvoir or power once was. Now the second issue to watch out for is one that is causing anguish to a few other countries as well, and that is the plummeting price of oil and gas that has fallen over the past six months from $120 a, bar a barrel to around 50-something. Algeria depends upon oil and gas receipts for 98% of its exports and has already dipped into its $200 billion foreign exchange reserves. And there are fears over what might happen if wealth can no longer support the extensive welfare state. Prime Minister Salal recently announced austerity measures, such as a freeze on new public sector employments. But there are signs that the country has learned from the oil price slump in the late 80s when sudden austerity measures helped prompt waves of protest that the state violently suppressed, setting the tone for the black decade in which upwards of 150,000 Algerians were killed. Thank you, that's all for my sort of opening Thank you. diagnostic. So you mentioned the black decade of the 1990s. Uh, you know, I mean, at that time, uh, I remember talking to Robert Fisk, who was covering Algeria in the mid 90s and he said he'd have to like go around Algeria in an armored car and 
it was very dangerous for Westerners. So you live in Algiers. How, how, what's, what's the level of threat that you face? Um, you know, I th we feel completely safe. The thing you, you first notice about Algeria when you arrive is that there are police everywhere. Right. Um, and those are the ones you can see. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's some elements of criminality, but I think that in the north, um, the dangerous aspects, has, I think it's really over. And I kind of tend to, you know, buy the argument that Algeria is a post-Arab Spring country. Do they have a free press uh, of any kind? The press has been very critical. Um, you have, you get all sorts of opinions in it. Um, do they see you, uh, I mean, how do they, I mean, how do they conceptualize Western reporters asking sensitive questions about their security? I have, I have an interesting status, so I'm not, a, I'm a researcher, not a journalist. Mm -hmm. So that puts me in, in an kind of unusual position, um, and one which people get suspicious about as well. <laughs> but, um, you know, Algerians have a tendency to sort of feel lots of conspiracies and um, ask lots of questions and you know I think that the country has been closed for for many years um, and they're starting to sort of slowly open up I think that's a really good thing but compared to countries like Morocco or Tunisia um, people are much less used to interacting with Westerners who are in their country you know there's also no tourism in Algeria so I think it's it's good to sort of be there and, and interact with people are they uh, are, do Algerians feel sort of some form of self-satisfaction when they look over the the border into Libya and see all the chaos going on there, there and the fact that AQIM took over half of Mali and Tunisia, there's sort of a certain amount of unrest. Do they, uh, you know, are they grateful to the regime, you know, understanding that of course that it's an authoritarian regime? I think, I think there's an element of, of we told you so. Hmm. Um, I think the regime is, is, you know, has an element of we told you so that they, they pull out in meetings with diplomats quite a bit. Um, but I think that that's cut short by the, the very real dangers that the chaos on their borders um, represents for Algeria. Now, the two brothers in Paris who conducted the attack on Charlie, Sh uh, Charlie Hebdo uh, newspaper um, were both of Algerian descent. Um, what do you make of that? And, and secondarily, why is it that Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, which after all is a Francophone, pan-North African entity, has never that they didn't hook up with AQIM that they chose uh, Al Qaeda in the, in the Arabian Peninsula, and why is it uh, also that you would th that AQIM really doesn't have a history of attacking in the West? Okay, um, I mean for for the first question, I think that this is really this phenomenon is really born and, and bred in France yeah. um, of of what these two brothers are doing and the fact that there's even um, you know a West African who seems to be mixed up in it a Koulibaly. Um, do you think he's Senegalese or what? Uh, he could be Malian. He could be from Cote d'Ivoire. Yeah. Um, you know, definitely Francophone West Africa. Um, and I think that that's much more related to, you know, politics in France than it is to Algeria. Um, I, know but I know this is speculative, but if I was a Fran Francophone uh, terrorist uh, in the making, w why wouldn't I go to a Francophone country knowing that AQIM is there? Why has there been so little kind of back and forth between uh, this group in North Africa and France itself? Well, AQIM, I mean, AQIM in, in North Africa has really been pushed. Um, it has very little presence in, within Algeria. You had one offshoot group that has allied with the Islamic State now. Um, mm. So you have the rivalry between yeah, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, which is starting and to translate. That's the group that beheaded uh, the, the 55-year-old French. Correct. Was he a tourist? He was like a, a mountain guide, right. I think. He was a mountaineer. Um, so, you know, those... those Where did that event ha take place? That was in the Kabylie Mountains in northeastern Algeria. Uh, northeastern Algeria. Yeah. And so the... Anim uh, I'm going to mangle the pronunciation, but the Anamenes uh, Al uh, gas facilities in south uh, eastern Eastern Al Algeria. Mm -hmm. um, and t t what about... Talk, talk to us a little bit about that event. I mean... Um, what was the what was the motivation there? Or how successful was it? Did it help AQIM or and, and give us a sense of AQIM's relative strength right now? You know, I'm not I'm not the best person yeah. to talk to about those sorts of things. But I think that you know the the goal was to um, strike at Algeria. Uh, you know that group, which is led by Mokhtar Bel Mokhtar, still has ties to is less transnational perhaps, and still has ties to still has a desire to hurt the Algerian regime, um, and that was a really big blow on the Algerian regime. 
Um, so I think that, you know, they, they intended in the beginning, I think, to blow up the gas plants. Um, mm. They had worked with, the interesting angle for me about that attack is that they were able to tap into local networks of disaffected people um, who were unhappy with the stagnating development in the South and, you know, helped the reports on the attack afterwards showed that, you know, they were able to work with locals, um, drivers, and people who, were, who had sort of worked on the plant that gave them information. Mm. So when the attackers came in, they knew exactly where everything was, and, mm. you know, they were going to blow up the plant. They knew how to shut off the electricity. Um, they had very detailed information. And did that precede or follow the French incursion into Mali? It was just after. Um, and they said that it was in retaliation for, okay. for the French incursion. And but it was, but it seemed like something that had been planned for a while. So that was how, how would you argument. assess the uh, the success or failure? I mean, it seems pretty successful. The French went into northern Mali. After all, it was part of the French Empire until relatively recently. They were greeted as an army of liberation. Al Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb lost control. Uh, how, give us your assessment of how that operation went and and the likelihood of it sort of sticking, as it were. Basically, they, they liberated the three main towns from, you know, jihadi administration hmm. um, and killed a bunch of people. And, why, and you, Ma Malians were not happy about sort of being subjected to Taliban-style rule, right? They were not. No, they were, they were extremely, it was very oppressive. And there was one region in which it was, it was less oppressive, and then there were two regions in which it was very oppressive, and people were executed and had hands chopped off. And... Um, it was, you know, it was, it was creative in ways. It was destructive in, in other ways. Um, what, what's happening in Tunisia right now? Um, because it seems to be the, if there is a, a country that's semi-functional as a, a post-Arab Spring, it seems, Tunisia. They had a recent election. They got rid of the Islamists. Tunisia seems to be doing well. The Islamists sort of stepped back and said, you know, we, we know we're not wanted. We're not going to interfere. Um, they have a very strong political organization. Um, Algeria has been, you know, there's an interesting polarity now between Algeria and Egypt that's developing mm. with respect to Tunisia and, and Libya. Um, so in Egypt, you have this strong eradicationist stance towards anything Muslim Brotherhood or Islamist. Mm. Um, and that's partly why, you know, Egypt is facilitating airstrikes on um, the Libyan Islamist groups. Mm. Um, the Algerians, in after Dana. their... In, in Benghazi and, and Dana, yeah, the, with the Emirati airstrikes. Um, the Algerians, having gone through their own phase of eradicationism in the 90s, um, have now come around mm. to a phase of, you know, feeling that the best way forward is dialogue and to bring everybody to the table and that when you have this situation that most of these countries have where you have several kinds of radical Islamist slash jihadi groups, what you have to do is try to disentangle the ones that could be brought to the table from the ones that are, you know, radical beyond um, the possibility of negotiation. That's a very interesting point because Egypt also went through the same kind of uh, experience in the 90s where they had a sort of domestic Islamist insurgency and then it kind of peaked and then they, you know, kind of became more, had more of an accommodation. But there, you used the word eradicationist as an interesting. Do you think, I mean, to me it seems like a huge, I think that's going to backfire for the Egyptians in a fairly catastrophic manner over time. What do you think? I think so too. I mean, the Algerian perspective is that Egypt is doomed to repeat the failures of, of Algeria. Which is actually uh, some kind of- Horrible insurgency. In you know. Stroke, civil war right. or, or something, yeah. Right. right. And we uh, hope, I mean, everyone hopes that that's not the case, but there it's, it's incredible how repetitive this, this course seems to be. Tunisia seems to have escaped that, so they, they get known as the success story. And what is going on in Libya, to the extent that it can be ascertained? Um, Libya, you know, Libya, I know less. I know that Algeria mm. has, has reached out to um, all of the groups and that Algeria is making behind the scenes a good reputation for mm. its efforts to try to promote dialogue. I think that there's a certain appetite for um, another intervention in Libya. Um, some of the West African countries support that. And that's mm. based on a sort of knee-jerk reaction to, you know, these, these fundamentalists are running around. Nobody has a hold on what they're doing. The weapons in the region are incredible. Uh, Gulf countries are pouring money into it. Um, something has to be done. What would that intervention look like and who would participate? I have no idea. Yeah. Um, Algeria is doing everything it can to try to prevent that from happening. And their, their feeling is that, you know, there needs to be a state. There needs to be something. There needs to be a power structure put into place. Could you imagine a role for the African Union or anything like that? Or is that out of the question? I think it would be, I don't, th I think it would probably be a good idea, but I don't see it happening. 
Because, I mean, I mean, what's going on in Libya right now is sort of not unanalogous to what went on in Somalia, right? And, uh, I mean, the African Union seems to have been quite successful in Somalia. We have an actual Somali government now, uh, so you can imagine. But that, it may, that would take, I guess, some, some time to, to put together. And so Morocco, uh, how, what's your assessment of kind of the regime? And, again, it seems to be a place that's doing sort of semi-well. Yeah, I th you know, Morocco is, is very stable and, and, you know, very, everything, everything seems to be going well. They have some protests uh, from time to time, you know, and, and some identity issues, but I think everything... The protests are allowed. Protests are allowed, there. yeah. They're more, they're more um, open to protests than the Algerians are. And is King Mohammed, is it King Mohammed VI, is, it he, is he a constitutional monarch in the sort of 18th century English sense, or what is he? Um, I mean, he... he or he 19th know. century, maybe, English sense. Mm-hmm. Can you say can you say more about that? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, there's sort of like the 19th century English monarchy, where there was a monarchy, but it was constrained by parliament and public opinion and the media. It wasn't an absolute monarchy. He's uh, he has more power than that, you know. I mean, he right. has you know he has control over the military. He's the head of the you know the religious. Uh, well, I mean, the queen is still the head of the Church of England. Yeah, uh, he so controls all the economic <laughs> all the economic interests in the kingdom. Right. But so, what is he? But has he done anything? Why is it that he? It's interesting that the monarchies, the Jordanians and the the um, um, and the Moroccans um, seem, and the, some of the Gulf states seem to be doing better. What, why? Why do you think that is? One one diplomat I spoke with in Algeria said that you know she thinks it's really the authoritarian. Um, it's not necessarily related to being a monarchy, but it's the really strongly authoritarian. You know, I mean, that could go either way. Mubarak was authoritarian. Well, so was Gaddafi. Right. So totalitarian. Right. Can right. I suggest a reason why maybe? I don't know. I mean, if you look at, I mean, the, the monarchies seem are more legitimate. I mean, King Mohammed VI says he's a direct descendant of the Prophet Mohammed, which he probably is. Mm -hmm. um, there's been the, I don't know how long the Moroccan monarchy has been around, but I mean, these other, the Gaddafis, the Mubaraks, are military dictators who came to power relatively recently. And so, the, I mean, the, but the monarchy, it is a fact that the monarchies have been less affected by these popular revolutions. It's Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. So what do, you, what, what do you ascribe that to? I mean, I can the only thing I can say from my experience is that, um, you know, during the, the four years that I lived in Morocco, hmm. um, pe there is a very, very strong attachment to the monarchy hmm. um, that you'll find in sort of every individual there. You know, people don't criticize the monarchy, not because they'll get in trouble if they were to, but because, you know, there's this sort of, um, they accept it and, yeah. and they and they like it and that's that's their you know government let's of choice. Let's open up to Q and A. If you have a question, just wait for the microphone. Identify yourself. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, it'll come on when you start talking. Okay, um, my name is Ilhan Kagri and I am uh, affiliated with the Muslim Public Affairs Council, and. Um, I'm currently working on a human rights uh, Sharia compliance um, report card from uh, nine Muslim countries. And Algeria was one of them, and I finished that report a year ago. It's up on the mpac.org website if you're interested in, in taking a look at it. Um, there's a lot of footnotes, so a lot of information about the laws of Algeria and um, the constitutions and things like that. But the question that I wanted to ask you is, um, what do you think about what's going on inside the Sahrawi uh, refugee camp and uh, what Algeria is doing with that? Is there any movement in terms of trying to move those people, integrate those people, change the uh, Politburo um, rule over that camp? And is it, you know, potentially a source of, uh, you know, uh, violent extremism? And secondly, um, you know, the, the great sieve that's coming from Syria, There's are, are the Syrians making it to, Syrian or Iraqi refugees making it to Algeria? Because they're certainly you know, even making it to South America. So what's going on with that? And, and a follow-up, other yeah. Algerian foreign fighters going the other direction to Syria and Iraq. Sure, sure, okay. Um, you know, as far as the, the Sahrawi refugee camps go in Tindouf, what I can, can say is try to dispel a couple of the popularly held myths. You know, I've been several times to the camps um, I've had several, I've had all the freedom in the world to walk around freely, speak to who, whomever I would like to speak to. Um, you know, the, there's this sort of a couple of myths out there. One is that the Polisario is the puppet of the Algerian regime. Um, they're an extremely independent, um, I would say very democratic uh, organization. You know, all of the refugees are involved in administrating the camps. Um, they have regular elections. Uh, and, you know, as far as radicalism and terrorism coming out of the camps, there were a couple of Sahrawis who were involved in the jihadi groups that took over northern Mali. Um, 
my, my information is that they actually come from the Moroccan occupied part of the Western Sahara and not from the refugee camps. So this is another myth that we often hear, um, especially in, in DC, you know, that the, the refugee camps at Tindouf are just pumping out these disaffected 20-something um, jihadis. And as far as I know, you know, there hasn't been a single person who's come out of the camps and, and embraced um, jihad. They're involved in this peaceful struggle now. Um, and that's really, you know, embraced by pretty much everybody in the camps that you talk to. There's really overwhelming solidarity about um, using nonviolent means of resistance uh, for the Polisario. Um, Syrian refugees, I think, you know, Algeria has, has taken in quite a few. At some point there was a security risk um, linked with that. They uncovered some sort of network. Um, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know much, much more about it beyond that. And then in terms of foreign fighters, I think that um, this is the best evidence for Algeria's claim that it's in a sort of post-Arab Spring state. Um, you know, you have a couple of thousand from Tunisia, 1,500 from Morocco, um, and Tunisia is, of course, very small compared to Algeria, which is about the same population as Morocco. And you had a few hundred, I think it was under 300 mm. uh, fighters who were said to have gone from Algeria to um, join up with the, the Islamic State. Um, so, you know, what I think that that really, what that really indicates, and, so, and uh, at least half of those, in my information is that um, the, some of the ones who were counted as Algerian were actually, actually came up through France and Belgium. Um, so the numbers are even smaller. So I think that it's, you know, it's really strong evidence for the fact that Algeria has moved on. Um, you know, you still have conservative Islam at the heart of the society. The society is very, is very conservative in many ways, but the idea that you can use, you know, jihad and radical means um, within the political sphere has just been, is, is out of vogue in Algeria. Great. Gentleman here. Uh, my name is Nate Mason. I'm an independent consultant and previously served at the U.S. Embassy in Tripoli. Uh, I guess two questions. One is uh, when you mentioned threats to the to the regime, you didn't mention the recent uh, protests by actual security forces, right? The, the police have been protesting against corruption within the ministry and, and actually walked off the job uh, protecting embassies in the capital, causing a lot of uh, nervousness among some of the foreign diplomats. So just wondering if you could say anything about that. And then secondly, if you have anything to say about uh, economic reform, my, my personal experience seems to indicate that there's, there's a lot of talk, but I hear the same things uh, from Algerian government officials. But if, if you see any, any real economic reform on the horizon. Yeah, those are, great. Those are both really good questions. Um, you know, the, the strike of the police was fascinating. Um, and it's probably the most, I would say, the most significant event that's taken place politically since I've been there. Um, you know, it's hard to know what to make of it. It began as a strike of riot police in Gardaia that was related to this issue of southern protests that I've touched on. Um, this, this thorny religious ethnic problem that the Algerian government has not been able to solve and is just making worse. Um, and it's what is that problem? There's, there's some clashes between two different, you know, the Berber, a Berber um, group in the southern town of Gardaia and, you know, the, an Arab group in the same southern town. Um, so the, you know, the riot police, I guess, had been overextended down there and were eating tuna cans and had, didn't have breaks to go home and see their families in the north. Um, so they went on strike. And the next day it was in the capital and you had police marching on the presidency, which in Algeria, in a place where you can't even protest, was a very significant event. Um, you know, what to make of it? Uh, it's, it's really hard to say. You know, there are some people who would say that that kind of shows you that there's some inner discord among the, the workings of the pouvoir and that maybe one branch was trying to show the other branch or destabilize the other branch. Um, I'm inclined to, to kind of agree with that sort of argument. Um, everything's very tightly controlled in Algeria and to see something like that happen is, is probably means that someone was behind it. Um, it didn't feel spontaneous in some, in some ways. Um, and for your second question about economic reform, I think that, you know, the Algerians have been speaking for years about diversifying their economy, and that's really what needs to happen. Um, if there's anything that's going to force you to start acting more quickly, it's this sudden drop in oil prices, right? Um, does that mean it will happen? You know, there's a stickiness in the Algerian um, state that's related to, you know, the bureaucracy and the immense public sector. Um, so I think it's really hard to move things forward. You know, Morocco is a country which is, is able to, has a relatively liberalized economy and is able to move through innovation and create things kind of quickly. 
And in Algeria, everything takes a lot more time. So I think that they're sort of um, institutionally hampered, but probably have a much higher incentive now. Any other questions? Go ahead. Um, so uh, my research showed that um, women in Algeria ha have a lot more power and um, participate a lot more than other Muslim or Arab countries in government and just in the economic sphere. Did you find that? Do you feel that uh, maybe part of the difference of you know this reconciliate this uh, idea of uh, more conciliatory approaches uh, is coming from the fact that women are more participatory, or just in general, what do you think about the uh, the role of women in in government and in policy? Um, you know, there are a lot of obstacles to to Algerian women um, having you know strong decision making roles, um, but the Algerian women that do have are very very have very very strong personalities. Um, you know, I think that there's one kind of strange statistic. The, the women in Algeria outnumber the men by something like, any Algerian will tell you this, that it's something like 65, 35. No one really knows why this is. Um, it Maybe it's not true, but Algerians all are sort of convinced that it's true. Um, and the weird thing is when you walk around the streets, all you see is men. You don't see women. You know, the men really control the public space. Um, so that would sort of lead you to think that there was, there's really a situation where women have, are being subjugated and kept in the homes and things like that. Um, but you know, my experience doesn't really bear that out. You know, I f I've found the women kind of more militant and opinionated. Um, and you know, if you look at the medical schools, there's more women enrolled than men. Um, same thing with law schools. You know, the journalists are all women. Um, so it's there's some contradictions there, and, and I'm not really sure what's what's at the heart of it. But it's an interesting, it's a very interesting country. Great. Any other questions? Hi, my name is Luke Williams. I'm from the National Democratic Institute. I'd just like to hear from you how you think that the, the decrease, decreasing price in oil will be felt in the government and by people um, in the coming months and year. Yeah, well, they've, they've announced a freeze on, on public sector employment. Um, that's already a problem because lots of the protests in the South are about getting public sector employment. Um, people in the South feel like, you know, if, you have, uh, if you're working for the state, you've got a great job, you've got a salary, you've got a pension. The only other option um, for getting a job in the South around these oil-rich and gas-rich areas is working as a subcontractor, which means you have no, um, you're extremely vulnerable, you know, nothing is guaranteed, you're low, you're low paid, and they can fire you from one minute to the next, and of course, no question of pension. Um, so the idea that, you know, every citizen will somehow get a state job in free housing is something that's sustaining, you know, Algeria, and it's not possible. Um, so yeah, that's going to be that's going to be problematic. You know, what will it take for the citizens to sort of internalize that knowledge that it can't really happen? I don't know. Um, the perception still seems to be that it, it's working. You know, and people get Algeria gives you a house. You know, you can you just get the state just gives you a place to live, um, which is pretty unusual. Hmm. So you have to wait. You know, you might have to wait five to eight years for it, but you know. They're constantly building social housing, and, and they give it away for free. So, Is it gas or oil or both? Both. Any other questions? Hi, I'm Sarah Foyer. I work across the street at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Um, so you didn't mention in the possible things to look out for um, the possible passing of Bouteflika, which I guess people have been talking about for a long time now. But um, I'm just curious whether that's because you actually maybe don't think it's going to turn out to be such a shock to the system or um, kind of just your general thoughts about this, the whole question of succession. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is the really fascinating contradiction at the heart of Algeria right now is that the state seems stronger than ever and the president can't appear in public and, you know, can't even deliver a, a two-minute speech. Um, they have to do these, tele you know, these choreographed clips from time to time to show people that he's moving his hands and <laughs> speaking, you know, there's a microphone and some speakers behind him. Um, I think that, you know, there's some sort of internal consensus that he should be there now. And um, is there the same internal consensus over what will follow? I don't know. Um, but I suspect that there will be. And I think that it's also, you know, like I said before, I think that the crises on the borders are sort of helping the Algerians to stay together um, because there's such clear, depressing evidence of what happens when you don't. Um, they're also really committed to institutions and to a strong state. 
Um, and I think that both of those things are kind of overcoming individual egos and interests um, for the benefit of, of the country. That would be my assessment. Anyone else? Mohamed al Kawas from UDC. I have written a lot about Algeria. Do you, what do you expect if the president dropped dead tomorrow? Mm. What will happen in Algeria? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Your guess is as good as mine. Um, you know, uh, I don't know. Would the military seize power? Would there, there's no vice president. There's no heir apparent. There's no heir apparent. Um, people throw around uh, Yahya as a likely successor. Who um, is he? He's, the, he's a former prime minister. Um, he's got good relations with the military. Um, some popularity. Um, you know, it, it's not clear. But in the end, is it Bouteflika or is it the institutions who have the power? It's the institutions. So, you know, if he were to suddenly drop dead, I don't think that would, I don't know how much it would, it would really change. Um, so do you think the resistance to confront Le Pouvoir and bring on some sort of change is fear of a Pandora's box in terms of, you know, well, we're not quite sure what would happen afterwards and how it might get really, really bad afterwards? Yeah, I think there's definitely I think there's definitely some fear. People have the memories of, you know, the 90s was it was very recent and mm. um, there's really a very strong sense of collective trauma. You know, one security official official who I spoke with remembers that when he went to university, you know, it was there was a fatwa on going to university, so they had to bring their books to school in a plastic bag instead of, you know, carrying a book bag because you would get assassinated if you had a book bag in the streets. Um, and everybody, you know, remembers seeing people get shot in the streets and you know the the feeling of insecurity. Um, so they're the rebel. I mean, the was the GIA. What, what, what was the GIA at the time? Or, or GSPC, GSPC. GIA. I mean, yeah. they were beheading people in the nineties, right? That's maybe where this thing began. Absolutely, yeah. And people were getting beheaded. People were getting shot. Um, you know, women were getting raped. People were getting massacred. Um, both sides were doing it, and there was you know a lot of terror, and a lot of people were getting killed and going to jail. And I think of the wider global jihadi movement, the lesson they took away from that was don't behave like that. Of course, ISIS is behaving like that. But I think there was a recognition that that, you know, was counterproductive. Absolutely. I think, and I think ACME is, uh, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb really represents the, the lessons that they took from that. Because if you look at how they administered, you know, the three groups with links to Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb who took over two thirds of Mali and administered it for nearly a year, um, there were very few beheadings, there were very mm. few decap, you know, very few, um, how do you call when you cut off someone's limbs? Mm. And yeah, um, yeah. amputations, thank you. And, um, you know, the, as the AP uncovered a, a bunch of documents that belonged to, to a couple of the leaders, you know, this was based on a very um, calculated strategy of winning, winning public support, popular support. And I was really, I mean, when I went into to Gao in northern Mali two weeks after um, the French had bombed out the jihadis, the people had, had pretty good memories of jihadi administration, you know, mm. except for the few who had had, an, had a hand cut off. Others would say, you know, yes, I had a youth group. Um, you know, the state has done nothing for us. Mm. The jihadis helped us clean out the sewers, you know. Mm. Um, another one who was a woman who was a school teacher, you know, she said it was, you know, I said, well, what about the girls in school and things like this? And she said it was, you know, the girls were on one side, the boys were on the other. You know, I wore a veil anyways, you know. Mm. What, do, what do I care? I mean, it wasn't a democratic administration, but there was, you know, there were efforts towards state building mm. um, that I think get, get overlooked with all the focus on the sort of just immediately destructive aspects of being a jihadi. Anybody else? Well, with that then, uh, I'd like to thank Hannah very much. Can we? Thank you very much. Thank you.